I want to spend a little time today talking about an absolutely crucial issue, the role of women in the world. One of the most in important indicators, for example, of how the revolutions in the Middle East will go is how well they will treat women. Throughout the Arab world and in Africa, women remain second-class citizens, beholden for life to a male relative. Is this changing? How fast? What else is happening with women in the world? We brought together a terrific panel to talk about this issue. Let's turn to New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof, who with his wife, the journalist Cheryl Wudun, together wrote Half the Sky. One of the great stories from that book is that of Zainab Salbi, who also joins us. She is the founder of Women for Women International. Nick, how much of the treatment of women um, is culture? How much of it is religion? Uh, and how much of it is Islam in particular? There's no question that organized religions in general tended to take a social hierarchy that typically had men very much in top and sanctified it, kind of placed the stamp of God on top of it. Uh, and that this is true of a number of religions. On the other hand, it is clear empirically if you look around the world that the places where women are most likely to run into terrible problems are predominantly Muslim countries. Um, my own take is that that has much less to do with the Koran and with Islam as such and rather more to do um, with uh, culture and that the insecurity, the violence, the social conflict has less to do with the Koran and rather more to do um, with a cycle of not educating girls, of marginalizing women, which leads to very high birth rates, which leads to a very high demographic cohort of young people aged 15 to 24, which is the most destabilizing thing a country can have. And that the way out of that is to do what a number of Muslim countries have done, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Malaysia, which is to educate girls. And you know, the reason that Bangladesh is so different from Pakistan today, even though they started as one country, in part is that Bangladesh has done a superb job educating girls and now has more girls in high school than boys. And both countries are 95, 99% Muslim. And both are, both are Muslim countries. I mean, it's, and they read the same Koran, um, but Pakistan is a real mess and Bangladesh is not. What about China? Because, I mean, to, my, to me, when you hear about the treatment of women, you know, if you go back 100 years in China, women's feet were bound, which, you know, oh. people have to understand that it basically meant you were breaking the feet of every woman. In, in Absolutely. Um, 100 years ago, China was probably the worst place on earth to be born female. Uh, my grandmother's feet were bound. Uh, but what gives me extreme amount of hope is that in one generation, that was eradicated. This is a centuries-old practice. And yet, partly because they had people inside China and people outside China, there were foreign missionaries also who thought this was a horrendous practice. They got together and they actually formed a strategy. Uh, they really were able to basically launch a counter attack against this practice and in one generation eradicate it in China. And then what Mao did was that he said, and this is really critical, he said that education for everybody, including girls. So that meant that girls could go to school uh, with the boys, and it was just mandatory education for everybody in the country. But then what was even more important, and this is a critical fact, uh, especially for places like Saudi Arabia um, and Japan, the girls were not only educated, they were able to work in the formal labor force. The society accepted them in the formal labor force, and that was critical. They could get jobs, they could work in factories, and that was the beginning of China's economic revolution. Light industry, which employed women making clothes, the clothes we wear, the shoes we wear, the, the bags that we, we carry, um, they were uh, made by women, and that jump-started China's economic revolution. And I think China is a good antidote to the way we tend to psych ourselves out about the Muslim world. And yes, indeed, in a number of harder-line Muslim countries, uh, you know, because of culture, uh, women don't have opportunities. But culture is not immutable. Culture can change, and China is the best evidence of that. And the other thing is that I think we tend to psych ourselves out and say, you know, should, isn't it a little bit imperialist for us to be telling other countries how to treat women? You know, isn't that a value that we should leave it to them to decide? And I think, again, um, you know, Cheryl just feels so fortunate that there were outsiders who were willing to yeah. push against the practice of foot binding. Mm -hmm. And I think there are some practices that you just have to say are um, not acceptable. Well, in India, you know, there the, the used to be a practice, a Hindu practice, that the woman was tossed on the, on the funeral pyre, on the burning funeral pyre of the man right. uh, in a, into, as a kind of sacrifice. 
uh, and the British basically just outlawed it. A, a governor general called William Bentnick said, this is abhorrent, and well, I don't care what people think, and it caused riots and all that. But talk about Islam, because yeah. this is something that, you know, we come back to writers like Ayan Hirsi Ali say, it's, it's Islam, and, you know, until you change the religion, really, you can't change anything. No, I don't believe that because Christianity at one point had that, Judaism had that, every religion had uh, this patriarchy and horrible practice towards women, it changed, it evolved. I think few but things. But it is true that right now the Muslim world... It's our dark has, ages. Yeah. Yes, I think Muslim world is, is living in the dark ages. And if you look at it historically as what happened in Europe and other religions, then it makes historical sense. And it, I do believe that we can evolve and we can, the religion can evolve. And we can do that in few things. A, I think revival of uh, historical characters in Islam, such as Khadija. Muhammad's wife was 20 years older than him. She was a very successful businesswoman. She hired him as her employee. She chose to marry him. And she was the first one who who helped him believe in God's message. Uh, the revival of characters like Khadija, if she was alive today, she would probably, to quote President Clinton when he went to Saudi Arabia, she probably would be the biggest businesswoman, actually, in today's history. And everyone except her personality and character, we need to revive her in a much more vibrant way. So they do believe in the possibility of a cultural and a religious evolution as all religions went through this uh, historical period. We'll be back in a moment with more from the panel, including why international aid groups now realize it is much smarter to give money to women than men. Why? When we come back. Between 50 and 110 million females are missing around the globe. It's just an astonishing figure. It means that in any one decade, more girls are discriminated against to death around the world than all the people who died in all the genocides of the 20th century. So it's just a, you know, it's a staggering scope. It is a truism in the world of international development that if you give an aid dollar to a man, he is likely to spend it at the bar or on guns. If you give that same aid dollar to a woman, she will buy necessities, food or diapers, or invest it in the family or a money-making venture. And we are back with Nick Kristof, Cheryl Wudan, and Zainab Salvi talking about women, culture, Islam, all kinds of things. Nick, when you look at this the statistic. Why do you think that that's true? You know, that's the part of it we really don't know. And there are various theories. Some people think that it's biological nurturing instinct. Other people think that's nonsense, that it's essentially the way we're socialized. But what is clear is that across continents, across religions, uh, across cultural traditions, that women are more likely to take uh, income that they have, and also if they have titled over uh, assets, if they have financial assets, more likely to convert those to the benefit of their children, and more likely to um, invest in small businesses. Do you have you seen this in action? I mean, are there stories of, of w when you went around? Do you f feel as though there are places where you actually could see this vividly? Well, there are many different ways that this comes to uh, come that this sur surfaces. Um, for instance, in microfinance, which is a very typical way uh, that, that many people have uh, gotten involved in this issue, uh, if you give a loan to a woman, uh, she really seems to can take it very far. When you give a loan to a man, he can take it somewhere, but often the repayment rates are much lower. So big uh, microfinancing institutions like Grameen and, and BRAC, which basically started these things in Bangladesh, they didn't want to be discriminatory, so they wanted to give it to men and to women, but they found that women were just repaying at much higher rates than men. They were losing money by uh, giving microloans to men. So they've now switched to 97% uh, uh, of lending to women. Zainab, what, what do you think about this? What's your re response? You know, do you see this on the ground, that the women put the money to work? Productively? Very much so. I mean, statistically, women respend 90% of their income or whatever their investment are on their families compared to men who spend, respend 40% on their families. But this reminds me of a story. I was in Afghanistan a few months ago, and I met a woman who was promised to be married at six, at the age of six, was married at the age of 15, was a widow and a single mother at the age of 16. And she talks about how you know her life led and what she's done with it. So she, during the Taliban, she was very poor. The Taliban beat her up for working in the streets um, with the very shoes, with the only shoes she owned, and they broke her shoes. And she was very bitter and, and sad about that. And when I met her right now, she is working. She's earning 
$450 a month, which is very significant in Afghanistan. She's sending her daughter to school and determined that her daughter will not get married until she finished college. And she's going back to her own school. She's finishing her own education. There's a correlation. If you want to change practices from child marriages to women education and women working in the economy, there's a correlation between that and investing in their mothers. And that mother, in her case, knows that I will not repeat to my daughter what I've gone through. And she is changing that cultural practices in Afghanistan or the behavior practices in Afghanistan. So there's no better investment in talking about Afghanistan as an example than investment in women who gets it. My money goes to my daughter who will go to college, will get a better life. What, what is the most successful place in which you have operated? You're, you deal with women in distress uh, in, in so many places. What's your big success story? You know, all of them are successful. I mean, we work from Congo to Rwanda to Sudan to Afghanistan and well, Iraq. And we started in Bosnia. And we yeah. started in Bosnia. I, a couple of things. One is we're noticing that the first investment that women make in terms of who they hire in their business is actually their husbands or their sons. The first decision they make. Um, uh, all of them, say, in Africa, tend to, women tend to actually run with that one dollar of investment and do so much of it. And that seems to be the most vibrant place in terms of change. I recently met a woman in Congo. In the midst, I mean, right now, as we speak right now, hundreds of thousands of women are getting raped in Congo. And this woman, um, it's the same story usually, it's a pattern of a story. She's uh, displaced, she doesn't have anything, poverty, her husband doesn't know how to deal with the situation. She went through Women for Women International's program. We taught her part of what we do is teach vocational and business skills for women, very poor women, to so help them stand on their feet and earn their own income. She learned soap making. He was cynical about her soap. She gave, it, uh, she gave him samples to show it to his friends, and, and he stopped believing in her soap. And instead of her running her separate business of soap making, she actually made him a partner, but a different kind of partner in which he goes and sell, gives her the money back. She is the one managing the money. And you see change, again, I'm interested in the changing of social patterns. She changed the relationship from she gives him all the money and he spent it on his, as you mentioned earlier, on his alcohol and cigarettes and prostitution or weapons. And now she reversed it. Now he goes and work and brings her the money and they manage it together about their sending their kids to school, better housing and better uh, life conditions for both of them. And so uh, the, the, I would say Africa in general actually where the investment is, goes triple the way than other countries. You know, there's, there's a lot of good news in, in this book, but there's also a lot of bad news in the sense that paint the picture of just how bad it is for women in many parts of the world. Maybe the best gauge of uh, the discrimination against women and girls is that how much of it is lethal. We don't tend to think of discrimination, gender discrimination, as being lethal. In much of the world, it is. And you can measure that by looking at the population ratios. Um, in India, for example, for the first uh, year of life, male and female mortality rates are fairly similar because they're depending upon the breast. And the breast doesn't have a sun preference. From age one to age five, a girl is 50% more likely to die than a boy, and that's because they're depending upon their parents who do have a son preference, who don't give that uh, girl the same access to food and health care. And the upshot of, of this is differential levels of mortality that mean that between 50 and 110 million females are missing around the globe. It's just an astonishing mm -hmm. figure. It means that in any one decade, more girls are discriminated against to death around the world than all the people who died in all the genocides of the 20th century. So it's just a, you know, it's a staggering scope. Final thought, what can we, what can people do? Oh, there are many ways. First of all, people have to care. They have to say this is unacceptable, as Lina was saying. And once each individual can actually say that and take a step, then the politicians will start beginning to notice that this is something that, the, an issue that the voters care about. It really does start with individuals and a mass of individuals to join a movement to create change. It isn't just something that the government does from the top down. The governments have to play their role as well. But you also need bottom-up. You need a grassroots, bottom-up movement that really starts to change uh, perception of, of, and attitudes around the world. Thank you very much. We will be right back. <laughs>